today, up to this day, we have the same God. We have a wonderful God. Let me tell you something.
He will show you how to love your children more. He will show you that true love that the world cannot give you. We thank you, God, for being that way, Jesus. We sing your praise, God. Your church worships you this morning, Jesus. Let our worship surpass the ceiling, God. It reach to where you are at.
next weekend for a very special announcement. So you know how cold it is, right? It's going to be one of the coldest days in decades here. And so, <laughs> I'm sure what blind love is. So Michelle tells me, hey, the electricity might go out. I'm like, okay. I was like, you know, she goes, we're not going to have it. She goes, oh, you can just go build a fire. That's blind love, first of all. What do you think I am, an eagle scout? <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that she looks at me like an eagle, but I'm a turkey scout, really, quite honestly. I'm like, what am I going to do, rub two sticks together? When in my life have I ever rubbed two sticks together and hit two stones? Never. But she believes in me and I can do it, right? That's blind love. That's not the type of love I'm talking about today. <laughs> I want to talk about some real love. Does somebody else have blind love? You look at your husband and your spouse and say, man, you're the greatest thing in the world, right? That's how my wife is looking at me today. So praise God. Thank you for looking at me like that. Aww. Definitely blind love. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't no Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts in my life. I mean, I was so poor, a little girl, when my uncles had to go and go to a, a yard sale, and he bought the Cub Scout outfit from somebody else. He said, man, I was out perpetrating a fraud, man. He goes, hey, like, he he little Cub Scout. He said, man, it never was no Cub Scout meeting. He goes, bought it for $5 at a garage sale. That's how poor I was. Nobody's with me? You guys got it? I'm with <laughs> All right, all right. Well, praise God. Today, the top of today's message is find the real love in Christ. So let's talk about some of the things that we love. It's not going to be one of those Valentine's messages today. It's not going to be that. Although you should hear the love of God every time we preach the word of God because God is love. Amen? Amen. What are some of the things that people love? They love other people. Some people love their jobs. Some people love what they do. Some people say, man, I love food. Some people say they love Houston, Texans. Maybe not too much today. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> Too soon. Some people might say, I love shopping. Be surprised to know that some guys might tell their wives, hey, they don't know this, but I love shopping. Oh, look at that. We love all sorts of things, right? We love all kinds of things. Mickey Gilly said it the right way. I don't know if anybody here from the 80s, but one of my favorite movies, Urban Cowboy, one of the favorite songs was Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. And that's exactly what's happening in this world today. We're looking for love in the wrong places, in the wrong faces, and all that. There's only, only one place to find real love, brothers and sisters. And if you're with me on this, we can only find it in Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? Real love is only found in Christ. And my hope is today, then, that you leave here knowing that God loves you and so that you can also turn around and love him. That's my hope. 
So we're going to go to our first scripture for today. Please make your notes, write it down. Uh, you go and study these scriptures on your own. You should. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I want to talk to you about it. If you have any questions at all, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. By the way, if you want to, the Bible is a love letter. But if you really want to get into the deep love letters, you go to the Song of Solomon, but you also go to anything written by John. Okay? All right. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says, We love him because he first loved us. Meaning we love God because he first loved us. Here's what real love is. Real love is kind. It's gentle. Real love is joyful and patient. And real love is merciful and forgiving. That's real love. If your relationships don't have all of those things, then that's not real love. It's maybe conditional love. But this real love is what Christ gives us. Kindness, gentleness, joyfulness. Fills us with patience. He gives us mercy when we don't deserve it. And then he forgives us for all the crazy stuff that we've done in our lives. That's real love. Truly. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is real love. John 3, 16, one of the most famous scriptures in all the world, right? It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. The Lord knows that we whosoever's are a bunch of sinners. He knows that we whosoever's have a bunch of dark spots in our hearts. He knows that we whosoever's have done things that we're ashamed of that keep us from him. But still with all of that, he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall have everlasting life. Yeah. Is that love? Yeah. Man, that's love. That's love. Unconditional love that we don't deserve. And once you accept that God loves you, and it changes you. It defines who you are as a person. And you know what? Once you do that, Christ controls you. You might be like a wild stallion wanting to run your way, but man, when Christ has you, man, he's got that bridle in you, man, and he's, he's got you turning, he's gonna turn you left and right just by doing this because Christ has control over you. Man, that's a great thing. But you gotta fall in love with God. And somebody may say, you know what, I kinda like him. I have a very fond of God. I know about him. I know I'm supposed to love him. If somebody says, do you love God? I'm going to raise my hands. But I don't know if I really love him or not. That's okay. Keep singing about him. You'll get to love him. Keep reading about him. You'll get to love him. Keep fellowshipping with other believers. You'll get to love him. Keep praying to him. You'll get to love him. He's a great God. He's a patient God. Remember, real love is patient. He's patient with you. He knows if it takes you three times or 300 times to get something into the thick skull that you have. We can look at the life of Peter, the disciple, and see how long it takes for Jesus himself to get something, to beat something in Peter. It took a while. Three times with Peter for everything. How many times does it take you to get something in your head from him? You don't have to say, well, Lord, you know, I, I should have learned the first time I'm going to turn away from you. No. He's like, come on, my son, my daughter, come to me. Let me love you. Let me rub it. Let me make it better. Let me show you the way. Let me help you. I'm going to show you and pour my real love over you. Paul, the disciple Paul, the apostle Paul was one of the people who received that love of the Lord. He didn't walk with God. He didn't walk with Jesus, but he still showed the love of Christ. Somebody who was having people killed, who stood by while the first martyr, Stephen, was killed and stoned to death. He could have been telling them which stones to use. Start, he talks about love in all of his letters. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 14 through, through 21. You know why it's important for us to read a whole lot of scripture? Because the word of God is going to speak to you. I could take one scripture and I could just turn it all around to fit my message. But here we're going to let the word of God speak to us and give us, give us his message, the Holy Spirit's message. Amen? Amen? So let's go. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Here's Paul talking. He says, either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. In case you're wondering what version that is, it's a New Living Translation that I'm reading this from. God loves you enough to give you a new life. I'm gonna stop in between a lot of these scriptures here so we can, I'm gonna teach you about a couple of things. We're gonna talk about a few things here. Think about your life. If somebody's messed up against you, did you just say enough? Man, get away from me. I don't ever want to see you again. 
Did you give him three strikes and you're out? I'm going to give you three, two more times, and after that, you're done. I ain't going to, never again. Christ didn't do that. As many times as we have sinned against him, as many times as we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, he still will give you a new life. Do you get this? A new life for you who's messing up and full of sin. We have crucified Christ. We are the ones who sent him to the cross, not the Jews and the Romans. It was our sins that he died for. And still, he was, he's willing to give us a new life. That's love. Man, that's not an emotional type of love. It's a commitment. It's a promise love. You know, it's the agape love. It's eros love. It's all of those four loves that the Bible talks about all mixed up into one. And, it's, and then it's even greater because it's from Christ. He is love. He gave himself for us. You get this. So he wants to give you a new life. That's love. Because if you look at your life, I'm sure there's people who betrayed you. There's people who've crossed you that you're like, I don't want to give them anything at all. Look, some people, you don't need to look back in your life. Forgive and forget is not in the Bible like that. We've talked about that some other time in forgiveness. But we must love them. No greater love is this, right? To give your life for somebody, to give your life for your friend. Pray for your enemies. That's a form of love. Praying for those who persecute you. Praying for those who are against you. Paul is somebody who did this. Paul is somebody who showed the love of Christ to other people. And Christ gave us a new life. Has he given you a new life? If you look at your life today compared to when you first gave it to Christ, is it new? How about when you first can remember your very first memory? You know what one of my first memories is? I was about four years old. And one of my first memories was a Godzilla movie. I love Godzilla. I know King Kong Godzilla's coming out with two sides at some other time, right? But Godzilla, that's one of my very first memories. From that moment until now, we're talking 47 years roughly, I have a new life. And it's a different life. How about you? Do you have a new life? That's a new life that's from Christ. That's from the love of Christ. The real love of Christ. Amen. Are you guys with me on this? Amen. Praise God. Let's continue on. Verse 16. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That's what I've been talking about, brothers and sisters. Let's continue. Verse 18. And all of this is a gift from God. Man. One of the love languages, if you've read the book, I'll continue just a second, is gifts. You have time. You have physical words of affirmation, and one of them is gifts. God's given us a gift. That means he loves us. I'm telling you guys, I don't know if you understand this. If you're looking for love, if you're missing love in your life, say, oh, I'm lonely because I have nobody on Valentine's Day. You have God, and he's got this big old love letter for you. If you Man. find it, if you just listen to it, you'll see that he's giving you gifts. Man, he gives you a gift. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself, Right? Through Christ, and God has given us a task of reconciliation or reconciling people to himself. I'm going to explain this in just a minute. Verse 19. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Reconciliation, church word, right? Justified. You don't go to Burger King and say, hey, I want a sandwich. Justified. No. You say, with extra cheese, right? You don't talk. You don't say stuff like that. So what does reconciliation mean? Real simple, I'm going to break it down for you. I have an elementary education. i got to break it down elementary for you guys. Reconciliation is restoring our relationship with God. He fell away in the garden. He's bringing us back. He wants you back with him. Is that love? Yeah. Is it love, brothers and sisters? Is that love? Yeah, yeah. If it was hate, he wouldn't want you back. But he loves you. Even with everything you've done, everything you've said, everything you've thought, he still wants you back. He's reconciling us to him in Christ. That's real love. That's real love. Let's continue on with verse 20. So Paul says this. See, Paul gets that deep down inside of his mind and inside of his heart. He's like, man, God wants me back even though I was right there yelling at Stephen when he got stoned to death. Even though I was throwing husbands and women and men and children in, in, in prison and they were dying, even because of that, God still loves me. So he's called me back to himself. He says, so this right here, verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassadors, meaning we're representing Christ out to the world. God is making his appeal through us. 
We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. I want you to get this. Paul is telling you right now, if you've been away from God, he's saying, come back to God. Come back to God. Come back to God. God is speaking through Paul and telling you, come back to me. Come on, man. You know I love you. I formed you in your mother's womb before you could speak a word. Man, I formed you. I created you. You're precious. In my, there's not another person like you. There's nobody else like you. There might be people who are similar to you, but nobody exactly like you. You are my special prized possession, my special creation. And man, I love my creation. So come back to me, my son, my daughter. You've been away from me long enough. And Paul is telling the people here, Christ is telling me right now, come back to me. Come back to me. Come back to me. Is that love? If God says, man, come back, back to me. I love you. I miss you. That's love. That's real love in Christ, from Christ. He's telling us, man, I poured out my blood for you. I gave my body for you. I gave my last breath for you because I love you. When we see the symbol of the cross, that's what he's telling us. Don't forget what happened on the cross. I know it's a decoration, but it should be a reminder of the real love God has for us. Christ bled to death. He was beaten to death. He gave his last breath for the love that he has for us. And nobody has ever done that for you except for Christ. Nobody has done it to that extent except for Christ. The blood and the cross, man, those are symbols of God's real love. So when we see that, yes, we should see forgiveness. Yes, we should, we should see salvation. We should see mercy. We really first got to see love. Man. Yeah. Got to. Man, I love my kids. I do. And I could be up here trying to be holier than now and say, I would do all of those things for my kids. I don't know. If I could do all the things that Christ did for us, his church, before the cross, and on the cross, and I don't know. But Jesus did it. The ultimate, ultimate symbol of love is what Jesus did on the cross. We can't measure God's love. It, man, it's unmeasurable. It's immeasurable, unmeasurable, immeasurable, say is the right word, right? I'm glad I got my wife some principles. She can educate me later on what the right word I should have said. But let me tell you this. The cross was the most excruciating form of torture in history. You bled to death. I'm going to give y'all a symbol. I did this before, but I'm going to give you the symbol again, man. On that cross, you were nailed. So if they were tied to or nailed you, either way, you would start suffocating because you had to hold your body up. If they put your feet in, they nailed it in, you would hold yourself up, but eventually your legs would get tired. Do you know the other thing that they did was they impaled people that were up there. It was a form of humiliation. It was disgraceful. It was just the worst form of torture. Now, in the Bible, in the Gospels, we don't see that Jesus was impaled. And Bell means they stick in a pole somewhere where it doesn't go. But there's a good chance that that's what happened. Just because it didn't say it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. We know that he was tortured and crucified. So think about that for a moment. He allowed that to happen. He said, I could call and leave. I could come to my father and legions of angels will come down and save me right now. But no, I love these people enough. I've got to do this. This is what Jesus was saying on the cross by staying there. So he allowed them to put the crown of thorns on him. Sticking thorns in his head. Bleeding, bleeding to death. He had them to strip him naked. If they're going to humiliate him, I know that we see him with a loincloth, but chances are, if that's what he had, that's probably all that he had, but he probably didn't even have that. How can you humiliate somebody if you, you have them walk around naked and then you stick things where you don't belong and then you're whipping them and calling them names and spitting and beating and pushing and kicking and making fun of? I mean, every form of torture and persecution you could possibly have taken. He took for us on that cross. And Jesus did nothing to deserve it. Are you getting this picture of how much he loves you? It was your lies. It was your sins. It was your stealing. It was your this. It was your whatever you've done in your life that deserved to get what he got. And instead he says, I love you so much, my son. You can't do this. My daughter, you can't do it, so I'm going to do it for you. My love is going to pour out on 
every drop of blood that I have, every breath that I breathe, and every word that I say is going to be loving all the way to the cross and on the cross. He didn't curse anybody. He prayed for his enemies. Man, that's love. He called out your name. He's thinking about us as he's giving his last breath. That's love. So when I say, I don't know if I can do that, man, I don't know if any person alive could do it. I really don't think we could. That's why he came here and did it for us. The ultimate real love that we have is right there. When I said you can't measure the cross, I want you to think about this for a second. The width of the cross, you can't measure it. You can measure that one, but it goes as far as it is from the east to the west. There's no end on that. The depth of the cross, the depth, it goes deep down inside of your heart to the darkest places. It penetrates that. You know where else the deepness of that cross penetrates? It penetrates hell. Penetrates it, man. It ain't got nothing on my cross. You know how high the, you know how high the cross goes? All the way up to heaven. Man, boy, that's love. Are you ready to receive that love? Are you ready to accept what he did for you to show you that he loves you? Because he does. When he was on that cross, there's in Mark chapter 15, you can see two different verses. Mark chapter 15. He talks about when they give him wine. I thirst. And so they put up water. So if you look at this, there's two verses. And it's not on the screen. Mark 15, 23 and 36. The soldiers mixed this wine to numb his pain. He refused it. In verse 36, though, he drank some sour vinegar. That was for thirst. Okay. He didn't want to numb the pain that he was feeling for us. But you know what the second one in verse 36 was? To prolong his life. It's a difference. You might think, man, did, why did he drink? Did he drink wine? No, he didn't. It was because he was thirsty. He to prolong the suffering. Brother and sister, do you get this? How many of us would have said, man, just give me that morphine right now. Give me a whole bottle of wine. I don't want to feel this pain no more. Just give it to me. He said, no. Instead, he said, okay, that's going to make me live a little bit longer. Okay. You know why Jesus didn't drink that wine? Because he didn't want to double pain. He wanted to show you real love, not drunk love. Wow. That's real love. He wants you to know I'm showing you real love, brothers and sisters. Christ, he suffered for our sins. He took no shortcuts to love you. None. The cross was stained. Listen to this. I want you to, I want you to hear the blood about the blood because the blood is that symbol of love that I'm talking about. The blood was stained with Jesus' precious blood. Jesus' body was scarred with his powerful blood. He left an empty tomb full of his resurrecting love. Do you get this? Resurrecting love. Your sins were washed away with his forgiving love. And the gates of heaven are open to us because of his welcoming love. Forget it, guys. Don't worry about it. He showers you with his gracious love. Gracious love. You get it, it's precious blood, powerful love, resurrecting love, forgiving love, welcoming love, gracious love. And then listen to this. With his last breath, he poured out his sacrificial love for you. Man, that's a lot of love. A whole lot of love. Only the one who loves you unconditionally can love you like that. And his name is Christ. His name is Jesus. Do y'all get this? Do y'all get that this is the type of love that the Lord is showing us today? He's showing it to you. Think about your life for a moment. I'm sure there's so many things that have gone wrong in your life. There's so many times that you wish, man, God, can you just save me from this? 
But if you look at your eyes and you think about this right now, you're still alive today. He got you through the hardest times in your life. That's love. You're not dead. You're not destroyed. You are still here. That's the love of Christ. I love my wife, and I believe she loves me. You heard that earlier. She looks at me like an eagle. I have had a hard childhood. I had betrayal. I've been abused. Many people in here, same things. Some of you have ten times things, ten times worse. But I have to remind myself of God's love because that's what lasts forever. So you can look at people around you, your kids, your spouse, your parents, and yes, they love you. Some of them love you conditionally. Christ is the only one that loves you unconditionally. When you put your trust in the love of Christ, in Him, then you can experience real love. And the truth of the gospel is, man, He died on that cross for us. He died giving himself for us. He was born of a virgin, a young girl. He lived 33 years. He had about a three-year ministry where he was walking around with people, healing, casting out demons, showing uh, his love, showing miracles, and doing wonderful things. And then he rose again on the third day, sitting into heaven, came back down, lived another 30, 40 days here with us, and then he went up to heaven and sent his Holy Spirit back down to live inside of us so that we can live like him. Man, I don't know about you, man, but that is love. Nobody else has ever loved anyone else like that. No human. Only God, only Christ can love us this way. Do you know that love of Christ? Do you know it? It's okay to say I don't. It's okay to say I want it. I'm not sure what it feels like or what it is. It's okay. It's okay. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it says, But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If you say, I really don't understand it or don't know it, it's just because you just don't know God. That's all. The good news is, there's nothing to be embarrassed of or ashamed of. The good news is, his arms are like this. He's saying, come, come to me. Let me show you all about me. He's saying, pick this up and read this and I will show you all the things that I've done for you. I gave you a map, a love letter that shows you how you fell away from me. And all the way through it to the very end, it shows how to get back to me and what's going to happen when you're with me. There will be a place where there's no more tears. Revelation 21, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering. All things will be made new. Man, boy, is that love. Truly a love letter. You want a Valentine's today? I'm sure the person next to you is a good filler for a moment, but the true Valentine is Christ. Give himself, give yourself to him. Man, he loves you. Find real love in Christ. Get to know God. Find that real love in Christ. Amen? Let's all bow in prayer right now as we close out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Heavenly Father. Thank you, God. Lord, you are so full of love. You're so full of kindness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for walking this earth, coming here and being born for all of us. Thank you for forgiving me for all my sins. Thank you for guiding me, Lord, and helping me. Thank you for loving all of us and showering us with your grace and mercy. Father, I don't want to live this life without you, Lord. I don't. I need you by my side every single day, in every single way. Father, thank you for your blessings of grace and mercy. Thank you for all the love that you show us. Thank you, Father God, for the comfort and strength that you give us. Lord, I know you're speaking to some people today. I know you're telling them that I will get you through. It may not be easy, you may not like it, but when you look back, you're going to see you are stronger. And you're going to look back and see that I carried you through most of that. That's how Christ is. When you keep reminding yourself of the things he's done in your life, when you keep filling yourself with the word, when you keep praying to him and you keep fellowshipping with others, you will see God in everything. He saved you. 
He saved you from misery that you're living in your life, but he also saved you eternally by what he did on that cross. Brothers and sisters, that's real love. That's the kind of love that I need in my life every day, all day long. I've told you this before. I need a, I need a Savior all day, every day, sometimes thousands of times a day. So, Jesus, we need you. And we thank you, Father, for the love that you show us. Thank you, God, again and again for all you do, for the blessings you are pouring down on us. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Listen, guys, uh, thank y'all so much. Um, for being here with us today. Um, I truly hope you'll have a good day. Valentine's Day, but just a day of love. Truly. Be safe out there these next couple days. We know that things are going on. And uh, we know what's happening. You know with the weather and stuff. Just please be safe. If you don't need to be out, don't. I'm just sharing that with you guys. So also look for an uh, email. If, if you're not on our email list yet, uh, please give me your email address. I'm going to send an email out to the church members about the special announcement that's coming up. But I need to get some input from everybody. This is a church, right? We're a family, so we do things together. They've got a very important announcement. Very exciting things happening here at Day Spring Cypress Church, man. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful to the McKnight's family. Look, they've been with us here three weeks in a row. Is that family? Praise God. So, all right, guys. So, Jesus loves you. So do we. We'll see you all next week. Please be careful on the road. Have a great, wonderful day. And have a happy Valentine's Day. That's my pastor. Woo!